Well, hello. Welcome to another episode of Women in the Word brought to you by Logos Bible Software. Uh, I am your host, Chauncey Allman. I am the manager, as you know, of the national presenter team uh, here at Logos. And one of the things that I love doing is being able to spotlight and showcase uh, various people around the world who are doing great things for the kingdom. And with Women in the Word, as you know, we highlight women who do just that who have a very powerful voice or an influential voice uh, for the kingdom. And today is no exception. We have with us today, Heather Thompson Day. Heather, good morning, good afternoon. Wherever, whatever time it is, someone's watching this. How are you? <laughs> happy day, Fred. Happy I day. am happy to be here. Good, good, good. Well, hey, I wanna, um, we wanna get into uh, your life and your work and your gifting and all those things. But let me, I'm gonna read some, I hate reading verbatim, but I don't wanna mess up your bio. So I'm gonna read okay. it ver ver verbatim. So for those of you who have not heard of Heather, if you've been sitting on a rock, but if you have not heard of Heather, Dr. Heather Thompson Day is an international, uh, I'm sorry, interdenominational speaker an ECPA bestseller, and has been a contributor for Christianity Today and Newsweek. She is also the host of Viral Jesus, a new podcast with Christianity Today, which charts in the top 200 of all Christian podcasts in the U.S. In the US. Heather is an associate professor of communication at Andrews University. She is passionate about supporting women and runs an online community called I'm That Wife which has over 270,000 followers. Uh, Heather's writing has been featured on outlets like the Today Show and the National Communication Association. And she's been interviewed by BBC Radio Live and the Wall Street Journal. Again, welcome, Heather. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> So Heather, I know you've heard that bio read a million times. Uh, you probably wrote it yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even hearing it again today, how does it make you feel? You know, I think on the other side, you know, all the time that's gone in between each thing that somebody reads. So it just reminds me of a God who's been very, very faithful to me on a journey that I've gone on in my life. And, and I was almost tweeting about it this morning because I used to think that God, I used to feel like in some things God was late, mm. right? But now I, as I look back and I reflect, I'm like, no, he just plants that promise, this little seed of a promise very early. Mm -hmm. And for me, he planted a seed very early. And so often as I went through my life, I'm like, where is it? Where's the tree? Where's the fruit? Right. You're late. But mm -hmm. now I can look back and say, no, he gave me, direction very, very early. And so anyway, I'm just faithful to him for the journey that I've been on. That's awesome. And, um, you know, one of the things that we like to do in Women in the Word is kick things off with an icebreaker. Okay. A question that is uh, kind of off the beaten path, but I think will, you know, give the audience insight a little more insight that you than you probably would wouldn't see <laughs> on a video or a book. And so for the special icebreaker question I have for you today, Heather, it is this. Now, oftentimes, you know, I just read your bio and it was it was great. You're talking about, you know, God's fruit in your life, in your life, and uh your reading and your your teaching and all these great things. But sometimes in life, we have things that we actually don't do so well. You know, mm. I, I, I'm going to call it an anti-gifting. Mm. And we want to know what is something that Heather Thompson Day is just not good at. You know, so I'm going to give you one. I'm going to confess my as an example. I am the last person you would want to be on your telestrations team. You know, you have to draw in the audience. Yes. You know, your team. I, I'm the worst. I mean, I'm looking at it like, how can you not see that's a dinosaur and you're calling it a school yeah, yeah, bus? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's clearly a dinosaur, <laughs> you know? So what is one thing that Heather Thompson Day is just horrible at, admittedly? This actually is very easy for me. I have a lot of things that I'm not good at. I have very <laughs> few things I think that I'm actually good at. Um, but I always wished I could sing. So my dad was on Broadway and mm -hmm. is incredibly musical. His entire family, I mean, like just every time we even get together with them, there's music and everybody's right. singing. And I- am not musical at all, much probably to the dismay of my father. Sometimes I literally think 
<laughs> what is that like to have dedicated your whole life to music and then have a child who can't keep a tune whatsoever? So I wish, I, oh, I wish, I wish I could sing and I cannot at all. You cannot. Now, so, what, you know, if, if you have a book that's on Audible, so there will not be a vocal introduction by Heather Thompson Day is what you're saying. Lord willing. <laughs> Unless it's a punishment to somebody or to humiliate my father. Probably not. All right. So now we hear it. So great speaking voice, great presentation voice. You just, you know, not the next. The Lord insert. did not. On whatever happened on gifting day, I was not there. You, when you, the musical you gifts out. were distributed. <laughs> well, for those who may not know, tell us if you could tell us a little bit about your family. Oh my goodness. Well, my immediate family is that I'm a mom to three children. I have a daughter named London who is 11 and a son named Hudson who is 10 and a baby who's, he's not at all a baby anymore. His name is Sawyer. We call him Soybean and he is seven. I also am married to my husband, Seth Day. We've been married for 12 years and we little background there he was my my first little puppy love in sixth grade in the sixth grade yes I I wrote in my diary at 11 years old as old as my daughter is now I wrote in my diary one day I will marry Seth Day which I think is very romantic my students since have been like did you like stalk him (laughs) all of these years how does that happen I'm like you know what a little bit you got to get what you want so. Well, so what what was, I mean, I know it may have been a long time ago. He was just in sixth grade. I mean, was he a great, you know, did he cr- color well? You know, what what was it that <laughs> said, hey, you know, I, I got to have his Crayola picture yeah. in my living room one day. What, you know what? 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 <laughs> we were really good friends. We were sincerely, and we still are, which is wild. Yeah. And again, you know what? I truly, this is, you know, I don't know. Other people may disagree with me on this. I really think God gives you the seed to your promise very, very early. Mm. And for me in sixth grade, I just, I loved him, which now looking back, I'm like, was that like, was that like the Lord telling me this is your, I don't know. And he felt very strongly about me as well. And then his family moved away. So I didn't see him again until I was a sophomore in college. Really? So yeah. man, this sounds like a, a, a Harlequin romance. It's like a, a, <laughs> yeah, a I know. man, one of those Christmas I didn't even, movies. You Chanti, know? <laughs> do you, wait, can I, okay, wait, 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 just because you said that now the people need to know. Okay. So here's, this is a true story. So I get in, so I see Seth, my sophomore year of um, college mm-hmm. on the campus. I swore I'd never go to, which is the campus I teach it now. And the only reason I swore I'd never go there is because I, I live in this town. So okay. anybody who grows up in this town does not want to stay here forever. Like I am doing. Um, right. so I saw him there. I hadn't seen him in years and I give my number to my mom to pass to him. Cause my mom was the director of financial aid. So she mm-hmm. gives him my phone number. He never calls me. So I'm like, cool. It's fine. No problem. Just <laughs> me then who felt very strongly. <laughs> I see him the next day walking across campus with this beautiful blonde girl. It's fine. Two Mm -hmm. years go by. I get engaged. um, I think a year after that. So I meet somebody else. We start dating. We get engaged. Mm -hmm. I call off that engagement two months before my wedding. This is a true story. And on the very night I call off my engagement, my phone rings and it's Seth Day from sixth grade who had saved that note that I passed to my mother to pass to him for two years. And he called me on the very night I had called off my engagement two months before my wedding. And I have been with him ever since. So how's that for a romance novel? That you should be in conversations with people from, you know, (laughs) lifetime or somebody. Yeah. 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 Man, that's an amazing story. (laughs) Now, (laughs) so you, so you, you admitted that you don't have singing gifts. You talked about meeting Seth in the sixth grade and how all that, but what did you want to do from an occupational standpoint as a a kid? What was your dream job as a kid? Be a writer. Be a writer. Really? I mean, I was, again, for me, the seed was very early. I can remember being like six years old and writing a poem at church. And I just remembered this one line in the poem. And it was that God watches us through moonlight eyes. That's the only Mm. line I remember. And my dad who had grown up, he had gone through show business since he had been like 17 years old. Um, then long story short, met the Lord, became an evangelist. But I just remember reading him my poem and I couldn't sing. Right. And my dad told me, unlike normal families, my dad was like, yeah, that's not your gift right? Like right away. He's like, Hey, sweetie, this isn't it. But he read that poem. And I remember him saying, 
Heather, you're a writer, mm. honey. You're a, you're not a singer, sweetie, mm -hmm. but you are a really <laughs> good writer. Like you got to hone this. And ever since like sixth grade, I mean, six years old, I said, I'm going to, I want to write books. And that was wow. laser focus. All I wanted to do. The only reason I am a teacher right now is because my dad, when I was probably 20 years old said, you have to have a day job. Like nobody makes money writing books. And right. I was like, I will. He was like, you won't. So you need a day job. And so that's why I, I said, well, what could I do then that would allow me to write books? And I said, teaching lets me have my summers off mm -hmm. and my spirit. So that's why I became a teacher. Wow. Now, at what point did faith come into play? I mean, did you grow up in a Christian home and you know, oh. out of the womb, you were praising Jesus yeah. or in college or how did that come about? Listen, I... And one of those, and I, in some ways, I mean, it's also obviously a blessing to me, but I think in some ways it makes it where I struggle, um, just being a good, uh, communicator to somebody who has a totally different story. Right. Cause mm -hmm. for me, I have always known the presence of God mm -hmm. always. I mean, again, six years old, I have, I, I was reading my Bible six years old. I remember just pr I, so many days praying saying, God, I just want to hear your voice. I just want to hear your voice. I just want to hear your voice. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. My father was an evangelist. So I grew up in a van really just going with him and my entire family. My mom mm -hmm. would run like the sound booth and lights. And my dad was on stage and he, he created shows like he would do on Broadway, but he created them for the church. It's, it's weird. You'd have to have seen it, but he was a fantastic, right, right. um, theater person. And so he, brought like the book of Jonah. He brought it to life and did Noah and Jonah. So I traveled around with him all over the United States and abroad my entire life. And I think that's partly why my family is incredibly close because we mm -hmm. literally grew up in a van together, mm -hmm. but also why I never, I always saw the Holy spirit. I saw it. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't doubt for me because I grew up in environments where I constantly saw people experience God authentic. And my father was a very authentic Christian, as was my mother. And so I went through various different, I was expelled from Christian school um, in eighth grade. I was like one of the first kids that they ever expelled. So I went through different things with the church, okay. but I never doubted that there was a God. And I never mm. doubted that. Um he was able to be sought after. I, I just mm -hmm. knew that. So I, so like my sister, on the other hand, she's always told me like, Heather, I've never felt him. I just take your word for it. And I take dad's word for it, but I've never felt God. And I'm like, wow. So that's one thing I'd love to talk mm -hmm. to God about one day. Mm -hmm. Why is it that some people don't feel him and his mm -hmm. presence? I, mm -hmm. that bothers me. Cause I don't know the answer to it. Um, but I always have. Wow. Now she's still that way today. Is that? Oh, yeah, my sister is a, practicing Christian. She's, I mean, she's a medical person. She's okay. a, she's a nurse practitioner. So I don't know if that's just like the different brains operating, mm -hmm. but yeah, she would mm -hmm. still tell you she hasn't felt the presence of God. She just mm. believes because she knows that I'm not crazy. Right. Interesting. Isn't yeah. that interesting? And I, so this yeah. is a question now I ask people all the time, have you felt him? And I've met a lot of people that say I've never felt anything. And I'm like, I mean, that just is so weird to me. Right. Because you feel it. You, you yourself. Oh from my an goodness. Early age. Yes. Did you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you say that because in the summers at our church, you know, here in, in Frisco, we have classes. You know, normally we have life group, community groups, you know, people, different churches call them different things. But in the summer, we have these classes. And this summer, um, there's like four or five classes to choose from. One of the classes, which is the one that I chose, is called and I forgot the official title, but it's something like God and science, you know, you, you know, does, does one disprove the other yeah. type thing? So we're going I'm through really and watching, stuff. yeah, watching videos of, uh, you know, different atheists and their views and all, and, and just sitting there and just, and, and it's really kind of like the, the nerdy people of the church. I can tell. Yes, I'm, I'd be so right I'm in, in there. That group. I'm, I'm, I'm right there, you know, and, and, and some, <laughs> It's, it's a strictly scientific thing. You know, the facts line up this way and you can tell there's not that, as you described, kind of that, that feeling because they look yeah. at it from a more of an academic, you know, kind of cut and dry standpoint. But I like you, you know, certain things that happen where you're just like, 
it has to be, it, it yeah. has to be, it has to be. And one of the things that for, for me, and, and it's funny, I said this in the class last week, which is, you know, it, the question was, how can you, what would you say to someone who doesn't believe in God? You know, what, from your personal thoughts, mm. your experience, you know, what can you say? And I say, my thought was, just from the idea of knowing what it means to be a Christian, you know, I was once blind and now I see, you know, just look at life before, life after. And he's like, I can't believe that was me. And looking yes. at it today, it's like, I'm not reading about it from someone else. I'm not hearing someone else's story. I'm looking at my own story and how the difference between before and after. So to me, that's, you know, I'm like, how, how can you, how can you not? based on that alone absolutely as a, as a believer as a believer now you uh do a lot of work for women you know your bio even yeah. mentions that you support women you know how did that come about um that you wanted to be a strong voice for women specifically mm, that's kind of a sticky answer uh -oh. i think um <laughs> uh, so one of the philosophies that i have in my life is that you serve where you weren't Mm -hmm. And so there was very little space often given to me to serve in my giftings throughout my Christian education, mm -hmm. um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, I think because of my gender and I think race might have some to do with it as well. Mm -hmm. But so I, that was a lack for me of experiencing really strong biblical and spiritual mentorship from women. And, and not just, not necessarily relationally, but from a ministry perspective, mm -hmm. I did not grow up seeing a lot of women serving in various church ministries. Mm. And, and I had these experiences with God and I just, I, it's been very important to me that other women have representation for themselves um, so wow. that they can see themselves as, as Bible students and Bible teachers. So that's just, and, and then the other thing for me is college students. So I I'm very specific mm -hmm. about serving college students and serving women. I often won't take speaking engagements if it's not based on those two demographics, because oh, really? you can have okay. anybody come to speak mm -hmm. to your church. Um, lots of gifted people, but I feel like I have specifically been called to those two demographics and God has been really faithful to me in that. And so I want to be faithful. I want to, I want to stand in the gaps that I fell in, I think. Wow. That's good. You know, a lot of people, I think, fail to understand the importance of seeing people who look like you yes. do things that are important to to say, man, I can do that too. Yes. You know, and, and as a person of color, you know, you say that all the time, you know, I grew up playing tennis, right. And I was, you know, long, 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 long time ago. And, you know, for a, a long time, the only tennis player that you could see of color was Arthur Ashe. And just seeing him, it's like, you know, man, I can do it too. You know, I can, yeah. and, and just knowing or seeing to your point, just seeing someone doing certain things gives a lot of hope that, Hey, I can do it too. And it's not just hope. I just want people to know from the research, we know if you have, they've studied this over and over again in education, which is my field. If you mm -hmm. have a female teacher teaching a math class or teaching a science mm -hmm. class, female students do better. Mm. Same in engineering fields. So when we go through life, not seeing ourselves represented, it does actually impact what we believe we can achieve. Mm. This is every, the, we know this, yeah, right yeah. in the empirical scientific world too. I was going to say, and so the science now supports it. Yes. Wow. Now I know that being in ministry, it, you know, is not a popularity contest. Obviously, right. it's not. Um, however, we can't deny that your popularity is uh, growing, mm -hmm. and b based on that, what do you think about you? It's time to try not to be humble, but based on what you hear, what you feel, what do you think resonates with other women that is allowing you to, your gifts to be used in such a major way? Now, that is a really good question. <clears throat> I think 
I think one thing, and this fits with logos, logos, honestly, um, is I have really taken seriously my own study of the word. And Mm -hmm. I think that shows in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. you know, I read my scripture cover to cover every single year. I'm on my 14th time through, Mm -hmm. there are connections that I'm able to make at this point in scripture that I just couldn't have made at time one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a hunger. I think, I think we get attracted to knowledge and learning Mm -hmm. about scripture. And so I, I just think that's an area that I've tried to take very, very seriously and I see fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying where other women are able to say, oh, I can be a serious steward of the word as well. Mm-hmm. Not just in like a devotional, not that there's anything wrong with that, not just in a devotional thought, but I can actually pick up on themes in scripture that other people may have missed. Mm-hmm. And how mm-hmm. do I then use that gifting to, to share and, and, and teach and train others what I've experienced and what I know. That's awesome. And, and if I could give two cents, okay. you know, my opinion, and I'll insert my opinion here. Um, I think it's all of that. And I think, you know, when you watch your videos and, you know, Instagram, um, even, and I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but even like the proximity to the camera is like really close and it, and it gives like, Hey man, she is so authentic and, and, mm. and real and down to earth and you know you watch your videos and it has your your kid in a car and I saw another one where you had this filter on I think you and your your husband both did if I'm not mistaken it had the nose and the ears thingy going on and it's just like man she is just a real regular person you know who loves the Lord and you can see that authenticity come through and so just as a non-woman looking in yeah. on, on your stuff. Uh, that That's what I was <laughs> I appreciate I say. that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, one of your books talks about um, a lot about relationships and, and marriage. And um, again, I, it, the, kind of with the authenticity theme, um, it, you know, what are some things that Mr. Seth, I'm going to call him Mr. Seth, has to, it kind of goes back to that, hey, what are you not good at type thing? Um, and I'm going to tell you where this question comes from. This past Sunday, I was, we were driving home from church, my wife and I, and the kids were in the back. And I guess I braked too, too close to the car in front of me. Mm-hmm. And my wife let out this side, like, you know, like, why do you brake so close to the car in front of you? You know, and it, and I was, you know, I, I was like, you know, man, why did you have to express it that way? You know, we had what, what we used to call in one of our churches, heated fellowship, you know, on the way home, because <laughs> I'm like, did you have to sigh like that? So all of that to say, what are some things that Heather Thompson Day does that Mr. Seth is like, oh, here we go mm. again. What, what, are, oh, yeah. what we- <laughs> So we are, we have totally opposite personalities and I think, and we have totally opposite lived experiences. Mm-hmm. And so one of the struggles for us, but actually I think is also what makes us such a great partnership is for me, I am always hopeful. Okay. And I reframe every situation. It doesn't take me. So the other day, this is true. I I was Mm -hmm. going to a very important meeting last week. Um, and I got hit by a car. I got rear ended while sitting at the stoplight Mm -hmm. smashed up the back of my car. I'm going to need so much work done on it. Luckily insurance is going to cover it, but immediately my brain starts thinking (laughs) like, okay, why did that just, I couldn't go to my meeting. Well, maybe I wasn't Mm -hmm. supposed to go to that meeting today or maybe, (laughs) right. Like I always try to reframe to find the positive in why something bad has happened. Mm -hmm. Now my husband, his, his name online is actually original sad King. He (laughs) truly the glass is always half empty. He embraces being sad. Like he embraces the melancholy state of life. The glass is not always half full and that's okay. Okay. Right. Like my reframing of whatever bad situation, he's like, no, my Christian constant, like, oh, but th- God is trying to teach. He's like, no, like <laughs> bad things happen. Right. And it's okay. It's okay, mm-hmm. Heather, to just say, man, I am really hurt. 
by mm-hmm. this. I am mm-hmm. really angry about this. So when I go too quickly, I think to reframe before he feels that we have sufficiently just sat in our anger or our grief or our sadness, that is very irritating to him. And I have found that genuinely, I'm so grateful for him because he's allowed me to have better relationships with other people mm-hmm. who don't want to reframe. Mm. Right. And now I'm able to realize, oh, like this isn't, this is healthy. Mm-hmm. It's okay to just be sad. That doesn't mean I'm unfaithful. And that doesn't mean I've done anything wrong. There's so much I've had to unlearn. And this is probably from being a Christian female where, you know, you just are always trying to find the upside mm-hmm. so that you're a good Christian girl. Right. So I, yeah, yeah that's, that's been an issue in our marriage regularly but I, I think I'm getting better. I hope you know, at just sitting in, in the darkness sometimes. <laughs> so lots of sighing for Mr. Seth. And what, what's yes. his name again? Mr. Was it Mr. Sad Face? What is it? Oh, it's original sad king. Original he's my sad, sad king. king. He's my sad <laughs> king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in, in your book, um, you know, see you tomorrow. I'll you know, see you another, tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. Another relationship kind of based book. What does the title itself mean? I'll see you tomorrow. Mm. So this actually was during COVID. We were watching The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I both. And there was this scene where it was before the Bulls became the Bulls. And they make it to the playoffs. They're playing against Orlando Magic. They're super excited. They think they're going to win. And then they lose. (laughs) And everybody's totally devastated and defeated. And Tim Grover, who's Michael Jordan's trainer, says everybody's walking out of the gym because the season's done. Mm-hmm. And he just turns to Jordan and he goes, Hey man, just let me know when I'll see you thinking, you know, in two months, three months, whenever, w- just let me know when I'll see you. And Jordan turns around and he goes, I'll see you tomorrow. Mm. And the idea is that the reason Michael Jordan became Michael Jordan is when everybody else went home in defeat, mm-hmm. he didn't see it as a finite game. He saw it as an infinite season where you can always come back and keep playing. So I'll see you tomorrow. So we took that metaphor and wanted to use it for relationships in a time, I think, where there's a lot of really valuable, good advice about leaving and having a boundary Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. knowing when to go and putting your foot down. I really feel I'm worried, honestly, because I teach. And I'm worried that we're raising an entire generation that has really good advice on how to leave, but not such great advice on how to stay. Mm. How do we say, I'll see you tomorrow? That's good. And I'm I'm hearing you talk about that. And I'm thinking about, you know, I have some, you know, young adult kids now and, you know, I can see that where it's, you know, that kind of, my mom used to say stick to itiveness, you know, it's just. It, you know, everything is so short term. It's so yes. temporary. There's no deep, uh, not a lot of deep thought, not a lot of deep effort into it. So, man, I would, based on what you're saying, you know, I kind of read the excerpts from the book, but I, I strongly would recommend that everyone get that book. I'll see you tomorrow. Based on what Thank you're you. saying, it's Thank it's, you. it's it's definitely needed. It's definitely I needed. I think it is too. I think it's a massive cultural problem. Yes. Yeah. Now we, we've talked about books. We've talked about, you know, you grew up, you know, in the van and yeah. dad was an evangelist <laughs> and, and um, your influence that you hope to have and which is happening on women from a Christian perspective. What's your, what's your Bible study like? You know, mm-hmm. obviously you have to stay rooted in the word. You mentioned that when we, when I asked, you know, what was it about you that resonated and you talked about your study. So if we could, you know, what is it that the nuts and bolts look like from Bible study, you know, every day? Is there a routine every day? Is there a weekly routine? You know, what's, and I asked, let me give you the reason why I asked this yeah. question. Someone may be watching this and saying, hey, you know, this, uh, I love hearing about women's stories. I am love, I love hearing about Heather Thompson Day, but I just don't know where to start. She talked about not feeling the presence of the Lord. And, and you talked about the, and, and someone may be watching this, not knowing where to start, you know, in yeah. Bible study, you know, what to do, you know, other people that I've asked this question to will say, you know, I get up every morning, I put my headphones on and I, I listen to scripture or I listen to Christian and that's how I start my day. And then I read a devotional and then I read a, you know, two chapters a day or whatever that may be. So 
for someone who does not know, and they could, you know, perhaps learn some things from you in terms of what your day looks like, what does it look like in terms of Bible study? I will answer this. Let me preface by saying I am not at all saying that this is the method that everybody needs to have. And it absolutely mm -hmm. may not work for mm -hmm. somebody else, but I am very militant <laughs> about <laughs> my time mm -hmm. with God. It is. And I think some of it comes from realizing how important and I'm, I'm going to use myself, but I think it's true for every single person. Mm -hmm. Once you start to realize how important your life is just in the scope of who's around you, who got mm -hmm. what's put in your hand, I think it becomes very difficult to not honor the importance of your own life. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I get up every single day and I'm going to go meet with sometimes 200 different students. I tell my students on the first day, every semester, there will never be a day that I stand in front of you without having met with the Lord first. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that I, because I know how important your lives are, mm -hmm. I'm going to take seriously the responsibility of you being in my hand this mm -hmm. semester. And so part of my serving you well as your teacher will also be to serve you spiritually and to pray for you and to just pray that the, the Holy Spirit fills me that when you even, when you come forward and ask me a question, because I've seen this, this is why I'm saying, mm -hmm. once you start to realize God is always working, mm -hmm. it becomes impossible to not take it seriously. Once I realize that you may be coming forward, but inside there's all these things going on. And if I am not connected to the spirit, I'll miss mm -hmm. what I was supposed to do for you in that moment. Um, I have to have worship every single day. So for me, I, I get up at five and that's because I have three children. Mm -hmm. um, so the only time I have by myself often is like really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I get up every morning at five and that's my time. I read five chapters a day. And that's because I try to read through the Bible. I told you every single year, mm -hmm. if you read five chapters a day, you finish the Bible every nine months. Um, and then I always, now this is, this is a new thing I've added to my routine in the last year, because I went through a difficult season. Mm -hmm. I started going on walks with God. Mm -hmm. So I'll, after I read through my five chapters and I, and pray, then I'll do at least one lap around my block saying out loud, everything that I think God is doing or isn't doing in my life. Mm -hmm. And I hope, I hope that he'll respond. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just me talking. Sometimes I'm just, feel, sometimes I can't say anything because I'm so upset mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of walking in silence. And I say, Lord, let my faith be in my feet wow. that you see that I'm still here. I can't talk mm -hmm. to you right now, but my mm -hmm. feet are still moving. Um, yeah. So that's what my process looks like. I, I just want to say this though, because my dad said to me one day, when I was really amped on reading scripture, cover to cover every, I was really self-righteous. I was really getting hot on myself. Mm. And I said, you know, can you believe only 15% of Christians read their Bible daily, which is the stats from Barnard mm -hmm. group. And my dad said, Oh, is God only saving readers? And so that's why I always like to put mm. a caveat now, because mm -hmm. I realize, you know what, we all experience God in a different mm -hmm. way. I'm, I'm, I'm a student. Like I love reading. Mm -hmm. Of course I would read my Bible. I read books, right? Like right. that's how I engage in my own world. But for some people, maybe it's music. For some people, mm -hmm. maybe it's nature and going mm -hmm. out on a walk, whatever it is for you, just make sure you're setting time aside to pursue that relationship. That's good because when, whenever, well, oftentimes I should say as a national presenter for Logos and we, you know, we speak at conferences and oftentimes we'll do, you know, different workshops. And when we get in a workshop environment, one of the first questions I always ask is, uh, and this is whether or not they're pastors, preachers, teachers, lay or whatever, um, what's the one barrier? to you spending more time in the word. And almost every time it's, I don't have enough time. Yeah. I don't have, have enough time as opposed to what you just said, which was make time. Yeah. It's, I don't have enough time, you know? And, and these days we can't go with the excuse of not having the resources available. You know, you say listening to me, you know, those things that, you know, we didn't always have, they're readily available. Books like your, you know, your books that you have out, podcasts, we didn't have that. So there's many, 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 many different ways to, to get fed, if you will. Um, now, going kind of in a slightly theological direction, uh, you've talked about 
how important reading is and fellowship with the Lord. Are there, or can you think of something theologically that you thought scripture said one way, but over time your position has changed um, because yes. of your studying and reading? Oh, this sounds like so it's a things. no brainer. Yeah, so many things. I've yeah. Pick a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've discovered in the last couple of years going through scripture, so time 13, 14, that the Bible's not a rule book. Mm. And I had only engaged it time one through 11 mm -hmm. as a rule book. I'm going to know the rules and I'm going to do this right. Right. And I've realized it's not a rule book. It's the story of God per mm -hmm. continually pursuing people who never were able to keep the rules. That's what's it's knowing the story mm -hmm. of a God who is relentless in pursuit of people and keeping the promise. I, let me say this too. Um, Cause I really only started noticing this the last two times through scripture. So this is, I'm in second Chronicles right now. And you read the story of Solomon and all the other times I'd read through the story of Solomon I was like, wow, Solomon gets all of these and he's rich and he has all these horses and he's super successful. But this time or the last time, as I went through this story of Solomon, I started to realize, oh, like everything that the God had told them in Deuteronomy not to do is exactly what Solomon does. Mm -hmm. Don't collect many horses for yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't save up wealth for yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't have many foreign wives. First thing he does is marry the wife from Egypt. God specifically said, don't ever go back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> God specifically says, don't ever go back to Egypt. Don't go back from the way you came. Th they were supposed to be a people who had been freed from slavery. And Solomon starts instituting again, slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They became the very thing that they had left. And so that's, once you go through scripture over and over, you start to see patterns and connections that you miss. That's why it's not a book that you read one time. It mm -hmm. has to be studied mm -hmm. over and over. And then you learn these things. Oh my goodness. What we're seeing in the story of Solomon is already at King number three, the failure of Israel to be mm -hmm. the people that God had actually called them to be. But in America, I read the story of Solomon from my Western perception. Mm -hmm. And I say, he's a great kid. Look at how mm -hmm. strong mm -hmm. and look at all the things he's acquired. That's not the way God was looking at it. And the, mm -hmm. the, and this shows like, oh my goodness, this is, I could get into this, but like the, the, the beauty in the writing of scripture mm -hmm. is that the prophets and the people chronicling it are showing you they are intentionally showing you he's doing exactly what the rules said not to do. Mm. And yet God remains faithful to his people. It's an incredible story. So once you start reading scripture accurately, I went from a Christian who was constantly, I could talk about this all day, trying mm. so hard to be good enough. Mm hmm mm hmm and I read scripture accurately. And now I realize it's not about the story has never been about you, Heather, being good enough. Yeah. It's about yeah. a God who is good enough for even you. Yeah. And the freedom that I have in scripture now, the beauty, the depth that's there when I stopped reading it as a rule book, man, that's a gospel. That's, that is gospel. Right. That is good news. That's worth telling over and over and over again that I want, I hope us older adults to share with these 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids. Cause I think we've deserved them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And I just listened to, you can hear again, the passion, the authenticity about it. And again, you're talking about just reading it for what it's worth and yes. not reading into it, you know, not yes. getting to exegesis, eisegeting the scripture, but just read, just opening it up and reading it and hearing what it has to say. And, and I agree, you know, the more times you read it, you just, you know, different things come out. It's like, man, I missed that. Or I looked at it differently. You know, I was talking recently with a pastor out of Atlanta and the, the webinar is coming soon. I'll just say it's coming soon. But he grew up in a denomination in which playing instruments in the church 
is considered a sin. I don't know if mm-hmm. you're familiar with that denomination, but I mean, it's mm-hmm. literally considered a sin. And as he read through very learned uh, guy, I mean, he has like four degrees, doctorate, et cetera. And he told me, this is just last week. He told me that, um, so he's in a little, a uh, little bit of heat with the denomination <laughs> because as he read through scripture, he started to see how what they teach and taught doesn't line up with scripture. And it was because of him staying in the word. Yes. And so what's what's coming soon is that I'm going to have him on and he's going to walk through scripturally why, why he doesn't believe that that lines up. But he had gone his entire life thinking if, if live instruments are used in the church, it's a sin and you're going to hell. And now he's based on scripture and he's risked relationships and friendships because he's holding true to what he is reading in scripture. So any of those type things for you where, yeah, I used to not believe this and, but now I believe that, or just more so just not following the rules or not being good enough was um, what you were thinking. I mean, Yes. I tread very lightly and carefully Uh, because I don't know who's listening. That (laughs) is like, this is the truth, right? Like, so I I do so much study and communication. I know Mm -hmm. that once I tell you, I don't fit within whatever label it is. You think I need to fit in in order Mm -hmm. to be a good Christian Mm -hmm. that God is actually working with and speaking through. Um, you won't hear anything I have to say. Mm Mm-hmm. Genetic fallacy is a communication theory that says we decide what's true based on who says it, Mm -hmm. not actually what's true, Mm -hmm. but who says it, does this person fit within my political or Mm -hmm. denominational Mm -hmm. label? Right. And so I do try to be very careful um, when I say things because I don't want somebody to miss greater truths that, that maybe they would have missed if I get very focused in on a detail Mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. scripture that somebody will say, well, that absolutely is true. And if you don't think that that's true, then what else can I trust? Mm -hmm. And here, and Mm -hmm. I just want to say this too, like you guys, most of the, like, not most, the research is very clear that we are the most concrete in the things we know the least. Mm Mm-hmm. You actually become more flexible the more you read and the more you learn and the more you know. Mm-hmm. That's how growth works. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I'll talk to somebody who maybe is at the, and it's like, and I see it because it was me. It's like a, a, it's Heather from five years ago or 10 years mm-hmm. ago, who absolutely, if you didn't fit that label, well, that uh, I can't trust anything else you say, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? So yeah, I try not, I intentionally mm-hmm. am not incredibly specific. Right. You know, and, and, and I appreciate that too, because this is one of the things that I I learned was that there was a certain theology, I would say, that I was like, oh, you're listening to that person or that man, you should yes. run, you Me know, too. you should run, you Me know, too. how could you, you know, and then I, I heard a story from a friend who was talking about their mother, who was a huge fan of said theology, you know, well-known preacher or whatever. And because she was so diligent in following that person, she started reading scripture more for herself. And she eventually was saved. And had she not been attracted to that to start initially, you yeah. know, she wouldn't have been on that path. So once I heard that story, I was like, you know, yeah, theologically, would I disagree? Yes. But you never know how God's going to turn a situation around. And it may start from something that may not be as doctrinally sound as we, we may want, but he yeah. can do many things as a result. God is incredibly kind. Yes. I think his posture is one of mercy and kindness mm-hmm. towards us. We can be incredibly unkind. Absolutely. One, one thing, um, and I'll, I'll end with this, and I, mean, okay. I can go on forever and ever and ever. Um, but one of the things that my wife and I started about three years ago in, in our prayer time at night, we ask each other two questions. You know, I ask, then we flip it, and then she asks. And I want to ask you the same questions. And that's this this is every night. It's, what are you praising the Lord for today? 
And then secondly, how can I be praying for you? So with that said, overall, what are you praising the Lord for in your life? And then secondly, what are you praying about the most these days? Mm, I have somebody that I love very much who's going through a very difficult season. So I feel very, and I, I'll go through seasons of this where somebody I care about or myself is struggling. And so my prayers are very repetitive. Um, and I don't know if that's for me or for God, but that's, th mm -hmm. that's what I'm pr asking God for is intercession on behalf of this person that I love. Mm. Um, and what I'm praising God for is the little ways that I've seen God sustain this person in the midst of a very difficult season. Mm. Little, I mean, once I've started noticing all the little things that God does, I don't know. It makes, it makes the gaps between the big things much more mm -hmm. able to be walked when you start to see like just um, this, this particular person, a student sent them an email three months after classes have been out saying, I just want you to know I'm, I'm still seeing God differently mm -hmm. because of the way you taught all semester. Wow. And it was just, when you, when you, when you feel like God isn't moving to see that God was using you to reach somebody, even in the midst of your own disconnection, mm -hmm. that's a really powerful thing. So just like even taking in the compliment, how mm -hmm. often does somebody say, you're doing a really good job, Chauncey. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. really appreciate you. I want you to know that this impacted me when you saw me and we mm -hmm. just nod our heads and say, thank you. Right. And we move on to worry about the other, but we're not, we're not filling up on the thing that got the little drink of water that God just sent right. us in the desert. Yeah. Right. So anyway, that's, I'm praising God for his little, little moments of faithfulness that he provides to get us through difficult seasons. Wow. Well, hopefully someone watching will be inspired by that as so. well. Cause there's so many things to praise Lord for. They're not yes. always the big, big, big things. Um, some, as you mentioned, sometimes they're the small things. Mm -hmm. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we've talked a lot about your books, your, your podcasts, you, you have a lot of great resources and speaking of resource, and I want to, before we leave, I want to love for you to give uh, the audience a place where they can go to get these resources. But you were recently, uh, and this is like 30 seconds, if you don't mind, you were recently introduced to Logos Bible Software. Yeah. Um, we had a, you know, I think a hour or so session. Uh, if you don't mind, share, what, what are your initial thoughts uh, on, on the software? Truly, Truly. This, is not this is not an ad. My eyes watered with tears <laughs> during our tutorial because of because for me to see the depth that I'm going to be able to learn so much faster without having to thumb through different books and articles for, for it to all be in one place mm. and me to be able to do the depth of study that I so desperately like to do mm -hmm. um man what a blessing. I, I'm so excited. I went home and just kept talking about it to my husband. <laughs> I, I am so excited to dive in and write new messages using the Logos software. Well, great. Well, uh, below this video that we're doing right now is a link. I recorded a, like a 20 some odd minute uh, demo of Logos. So oh, at, once you finish watching Heather and I, go watch the Logos demo. You have and you'll to. Be able, please watch it and, and hopefully it can it can enhance your life as well. So now in addition to Logos, that's one we, resource we hope everyone goes and gets. Yes. Um, where can people go to get your resources, your books, your podcasts, talk to us. They want to go right now to go listen and buy. Everything. I can just tell. Everything will be at heatherthompsonday.com. Simple enough. heatherthompsonday.com. Heather books, podcast links, speaking, my newsletter that I send out every single Friday night to encourage people, heatherthompsonday.com. All right. You got it. Heatherthompsonday.com and on social media. I'm sure it's on that website as well, but if they want to follow you on Instagram, it's Heather Thompson, Heather Day. Thompson Day. There and we go. Twitter is Heather T as in Thompson, Heather T Day, D-A-Y. Heather, this has been a tremendous blessing. Thank you for taking time out to spend some time with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for blessing me with the logo software. I can't tell you enough how it's going to enrich my study. Well, I can't wait to read your next stuff, knowing 
that it came. Yes, research came from we're logos. going deeper. We're going deep. All right. Well, guys, thank you again. Stay tuned uh, or stay tuned in for the next episode of Women in the Word. Um, I have someone very special. I'm not going to give it away. You just have to keep logging in and seeing where we're going to go with it next. But today we've been blessed by Heather Thompson Day. So thank you. And we will catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>